It's great to see y'all. I'm excited about starting this new series today. Uh, So let's get right to it. We're going to start with Genesis 1. Easiest part of the Bible to look up, right? Just turn to the first page. There you go. You're right there. You can even pretend you knew it was there all along. Genesis 1. uh, So when I was in college, there was uh, one of my roommates and I had this old movie that we both liked and we would quote to each other every once in a while. And none of the rest of our friends had seen it. So this little gang that we hung out with they would just kind of look at each other with question marks over their heads when we'd say these lines. And so we said, okay, let's watch this movie together. So we went out and got rented the DVD. Actually, it was a VHS back then. Uh, and, and we had a movie night in, in one of the dorm rooms, and we're watching it. So don't really need to get into the plot of the movie, but there's a scene in the movie where, it's a comedy, by the way, scene in the movie where these Nazis are driving in a Pinto, of course, and they drive off an unfinished bridge. And in the movie, because it's a comedy and it's ridiculous, they drive off the bridge and the next thing you see is the car falling to the ground. But instead of falling off of something about 50 feet high, it's falling from like 5,000 feet. And it looks like they dropped the car out of a plane. And you show, they see the inside of the car, and the Nazis have their mouths open and their eyes wide. And then they hit the ground, and the pavement caves in, and they leave this big crater. And it's really funny. You have to see it to understand. But it's like the whole movie's building up to that moment. Now, so we're watching, we're showing this movie to our friends, and we're looking forward to this scene, because it's the funniest scene in the whole movie. But when it hits, some of my friends were engineering students. And uh, they were also in the honors program. So instead of laughing, they start a discussion on, how fast do you think that car was traveling when it hit the pavement? And so they're talking about physics, and they're bringing out these complex equations, and they're talking about thermodynamics and aerodynamics, that is, see how dumb I am, and, and, and wind resistance and all this kind of stuff. And I just wanted to go, hey, nerds, you're missing the whole point. By the way, this is why you don't have dates, okay? Now, I didn't say any of that, but it's what I was thinking. Don't worry, they're all married, they're fine now. But, you know, the, I, I wonder if... When God looks at us, and I know God is not me, thank the Lord, and life and the Bible are not a movie, but I wonder if God doesn't look at us, His people, and get just as frustrated as I was to say, you're missing the point. Thank you for reading my word. Thank you for going to church. Thank you for listening to it preached, to being in part of Bible studies, but you're missing the whole point. A lot of us look at the Bible as just a book of rules. And I'll admit, in my, in my younger years as a pastor, I used to say, this is God's instruction manual for life. But if that's all it is to you, then you're missing the point. Are the commands of God uh, important for us to follow? Absolutely. Will you be happier if you follow them? You better believe it. They are there for your good because God knows how the universe works, and He loves us enough to tell us the truth. But just following the rules is not the whole point of Scripture. There are others who look at the Bible as a weapon to use to to engage in theological arguments and to beat down people who disagree with us and to be this sort of low-rent David who lobs theological rocks at people they don't like. But that's not the point of Scripture either. Is there truth in this book that is unimpeachable, that we should stand on, that we should lay down our lives rather than give up? Absolutely. But is just theological truth the point of this book? No, there's something bigger here. The Bible is actually a story from beginning to end. There is a narrative thread that runs through all 66 books of the Bible, and that's what I want us to talk about in this series starting today. It's called His Story because we're going to look at the story of Scripture from creation all the way to the return of Christ and the ultimate redemption of the world because God's story is He is redeeming this world. He is bringing peace to chaos in this world. And the reason we're doing this is not just so you'll know how to read the Bible better, But knowing the story that God is in the midst of helps us know what our story should be, what your story, the story of your life should be about. It's not just making money. It's not just just attaining status. It's not just getting your kids raised up and getting them into a healthy stage of life. All of that's important, but your life is about something bigger than yourself. And so as we study this, as we look at this story every week, we're going to see what God is doing, and we'll know how to be a part of that. So, like any good story, we're going to start at the very beginning in Genesis 1. And even here, we often miss the point. 
This is a familiar passage to us, the creation story out of Genesis 1, and yet we often get into it, and the first thing we think about is, okay, is God talking about literal six days of creation, and is that a, a young earth six or 7,000 years ago, or is this uh, these representative of longer periods of time, maybe millions of years of time, and so it's, it's able to to work modern science into Scripture, and, and so which is it? And, and I'm not saying that's not important. That debate is not important because it is, and that's interesting to study, and it's good for us to know what we think, but that's not really the point of Genesis 1, and so that's not what I'm going to talk about here. So let me show you what I mean. Genesis 1, verse 1, the Bible begins this way, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, I'm going to guess that most of you are familiar with this. You've heard this before. Uh, you've, you've done Bible studies. You've been to Sunday school. You, you've read it yourself. This is probably one of the first stories you learned from the Scriptures. And yet, I bet most of you, if five minutes ago I would have asked, what is the first thing God created? You would have said, um, light. Because the first thing he says is, let there be light, right? But that's not actually the first thing God creates. Look again at verse 2. This is the verse we often skip over. In the beginning, God, that's verse 1, by the way, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Now, that's a part we don't usually focus on. What is that talking about? It's talking about when God created the world, the first thing He did was create the basic building blocks of the earth, just like a baker setting out the ingredients to bake a cake. So she gets out her pan, and she gets out uh, her, her cooking spray, and her butter, and her flour, and her oil, and her uh, sugar, and all the stuff that's going to go in the cake. She gets it all out. She gets it ready. That's what God's doing here. God is getting ready to make something beautiful, but He starts with the raw materials. The earth, when God first created it, was formless and void. That's a word in Hebrew. It's kind of fun to say, to, tohu wabohu. Kind of sounds Hawaiian, doesn't it? But it's actually Hebrew. And what it literally means is chaos. The earth was chaotic at its start. So picture just this mass out in the middle of outer space, covered with water, absolute darkness, no life on it whatsoever, inhospitable to life, incompatible with life. God sets out the basic building blocks, and then He goes to work on it. And that's where the familiar six-day cycle of creation starts. God says, let there be light. There is light. He creates the cycle of day and night. He takes the waters, and He, he shuffles them so that they're all in one space, so that dry land starts to form. Then He starts creating vegetation, trees, plants, shrubs, all the things that, that animal life needs to survive. And then... Only then, on the fifth day of creation, He creates animal life. He creates the things that swim, the things that fly, the things that crawl, the things that run. And then finally, on the sixth day, after all of that's done, He creates human beings. It's interesting the way God did it, because when you think about it, God didn't have to do it this way. Again, think about the analogy of a baker. What does a baker do? Does she look at the cookbook and see all the ingredients and say, okay, I'm just going to throw them all in a bowl and stir them up with a big wooden spoon and set it in front of my guests? No, because that would be disgusting. Try it sometime. You'll see what I mean. No, she, she, there's a very deliberate way to go about it. First, you have to grease the pan so the, cook, so the cake doesn't stick. Then you have to form your batter, and you have to do it exactly right. Sometimes you have to separate the eggs, and you take the egg whites, and you stir them up until they're frothy, and you whip that into the batter so that it becomes light and, and, and not quite as dense. And, and you have to bake it for exactly the right time at exactly the right temperature. Trust me, if you bake it too long... It's going to be dry, and nothing's worse than dry cake. And then once it's out, you have to let it sit for a while. Because if you just slap the, the icing on it right then, the icing is just going to melt and run off, and then you've got ugly cake. Everything has to be done exactly right. Did God have to do it this way? God's not like a human baker in the sense that He's not bound by our rules. God didn't have to make creation in six days. He didn't need six minutes. God can do whatever He wants. God could have simply said, let there be a universe, and it would have been just like that. Now, 
I know it's not stereotypically male for me to say this, but I like to bake. I enjoy baking cakes and stuff, and, and that's a fun little process for me to be a part of, and sometimes it turns out well, and sometimes not so much. But I enjoy that process. You know what I like better than baking a cake? Eating a cake. So as much as I enjoy the process, if I could snap my fingers and say, let there be German chocolate cake, let there be red velvet cake, let there be Italian cream, let there be carrot cake, whatever, I would do it. And I'd be about that big, but I would do it. So why didn't God do that? Why didn't God just speak it into existence at once instead of creating the basic building blocks and then going through this process? I believe that what God was doing in Genesis 1 is He's telling the whole story of Scripture right at the beginning. He's telling us right from the outset who He is. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but in the ancient, uh, the ancient, other ancient religions, when you read their creation accounts, their creation myth, they all have something in common. They're all about violence and war. One god goes to war against another god, or a group of gods fight against another group of gods, or, or this god fights against this big monster. But one way or another, there's war and there's death, and whoever loses, they build the world out of the carcass of the losing god or the losing monster or whatever the case may be. But the creation story in Genesis is completely different. There's no war, there's no violence, there's just a god who's bringing order and peace to chaos. That's what it's about. In the beginning, it was formless and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And it was good. See, God goes through this meticulous process because He's telling us who He is. He's the God who brings peace to chaos. By the way, I've told you this before, that word chaos in Hebrew is the word. Anybody know it? Shalom. Somebody said it. Shalom. The word shalom does not mean what we mean when we say peace. When we say peace, we mean either a war has just ended or someone has just turned off the stereo, right? We mean either a, an end to noise or an end to war. But in Hebrew, peace, shalom, means something much bigger. It means blessing. It means prosperity. It means you have everything you need. It means everything is the way it should have been. It means you can finally go, ah. So if your Jewish friend comes to you and says shalom as a greeting, what they're really saying is different from an English peace out or whatever the case may be. They're saying, may God bless you in every way. May you lack for nothing. And what God is saying here at the beginning of the Bible is, I'm the one who brings shalom into a place that has no business having shalom. I'm the one who brings peace to chaos. Between now and Easter Sunday, we're going to see story after story in the Scriptures of God doing exactly that, just like He does here in Genesis 1. He's going to do it again and again. We're going to see an old couple that has never been able to have children, and suddenly they come to know the true and the living God, and they start a family, and they have a purpose for life, and they change the world forever. We're going to see a race of people who were enslaved by the most powerful nation on earth, and suddenly they get freedom, and they get justice, and they become a nation of their own. We're going to see that nation, centuries later, lose their homeland, lose everything, and seemingly are cast to the winds to die, and yet they come home by a miracle and reform their nation and, and restart everything, and in fact are renewed. We're going to see story after story of redemption, story after story of God bringing peace to the chaos. And the really cool thing is they're not just really interesting stories and inspiring stories in themselves. They're all part of a larger narrative. Each one of those stories adds up to something. The older couple, the, the, the race of slaves, the, the nation that's been fractured, each one of them builds upon the other to get us to the point where God is redeeming the world, one heart, one soul at a time because that's what He does. And you might say, okay, that's great, Jeff. I understand you've got to have a series to preach on. That sounds good. But what does that have to do with me? Well, look at chapter 1, verse 28. Go down to verse 28. You're going to see the first two commands in the whole Bible. Here's your trivia question for the day. What are the first two commands in the Bible? So after God has created human beings, He creates them. The Bible's very specific about this. He says He created them in the image of God, male and female, He created them. Why is God so specific? Why did He have to create them male and female? This is why. Verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing 
that moves on the earth. What's the first command in the whole Bible? Be fruitful and multiply. If anybody ever says that God is against human pleasure, remind them the first command in the whole Bible is be fruitful and multiply. What do humans have to do in order to multiply? Ask your mother. Suffice to say, God is in the business of encouraging human pleasure when it is done within His will. Have we obeyed the first command in the Bible? Look around you. Absolutely. There's seven billion people on this planet. We have done what God said. But what about the second command? The second command is subdue the earth, have dominion over it. What He's talking about there is what we would call management. Managing, uh, let's say you're a manager of a company. You don't own the company whether it's a gas station or an oil company or an insurance company or a medical clinic, you don't own it, but the people who have the money have put you in charge. And they've said, you represent our interests there. You represent our values. You make sure that everything is done in accordance with the way we believe it should be done. And if you don't run things in accordance with the owner's values, you're on the unemployment line. Question. Are we managing this world the way God intended for us to? Are we running this planet, ruling this planet in a way that reflects the values of Almighty God? Absolutely not. Not even close. All you have to do is watch the news for 15 minutes and you see the, the, the chaos of our planet, of our world. And the Bible is very clear that it is our responsibility we cannot blame anyone else. We did this to our world. So when my daughter was a little girl, one day we, the two of us were home by ourselves. Carrie was uh, doing something, and, and so I, you know, it was always my job to keep her entertained. And, and so I said, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I want to cook. And she'd never asked to do that before. So she's four or five years old. And I said, okay, great. Well, we can do that. And I got down this somebody gave us as a wedding gift, this Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, had every recipe you can possibly think of in it. And I said, look, anything you want to make is in here. Just tell me what it is, uh, and, and we'll make it. Here's the instructions right here. And she goes, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want, I don't want to use that book. And I said, well, but honey, this is where the instructions are. I mean, these people know food. So if you want to make something, you make it based on what it says here. She said, but I want to make what I want to make. And here was her quote. She said, Dad, I want to make new food for the world. Now, how do you argue with that, right? I tried, but I lost. So I let her take the big mixing bowl and put whatever she wanted in that bowl. And so she did. And she stirred it up, and she poured it into a pan, and we stuck it in the oven, and we sort of guessed how long it would take. And what we ended up with was this gray sludge it, it, was not, it was not a beautiful cake. It was, it was chaos cobbler, okay? It was, it, was, it was nasty. And I ate it because I'm the dad of a daughter. And when you're the dad of a daughter, you just don't have a will of your own anymore, right? And, and so I ate this nasty stuff because I love my child. But that is the story of our world. Because here's God. He gives us this beautiful world. Remember, the end of Genesis 1 is, he saw all that he had created, and he said, behold, it is very good. When God says something is very good, you can take it to the bank. There is not a flaw in that creation. So what happened? We took God's creation, and we said, okay, I, I know you want me to run this your way, but I want to do it my way. I mean, I mean we're, we're humans, right? Next week, we're going to see this in greater detail. We had a will of our own. We wanted to do it the way we wanted to do it. And look at the mess we've made of things. I know this is controversial, but not when you get into the Scriptures. When you get into the Scriptures, it is crystal clear that if you have a problem with anything in this world, it's because of us. It's because of human sin. We brought destruction into this world. We're the ones that made this mess. And in our individual lives, we can look at our individual lives, every one of us, if we're humble enough to admit it. We can look back and we can name decision after decision that we made where we said, I want to do it my way. 
And maybe, maybe for some of you, it was before you knew anything about Jesus, and so you were just doing your best, you were just making decisions as best you can, and now you look back and realize, oh, I was so foolish. For some of us like me, who were raised in the Christian faith, we don't have that excuse. We knew what was right, and yet we said, okay, God, I'm obeying you with all this other stuff, but over here, I want to go my way, and my way never works out. And we end up making a mess of things. And that's what the Bible calls sin when we say, I want to do this my way, even though your way is over here, I want to do it my way. And you know what salvation is? Salvation is more than a religious ritual you go through, and it's more than just signing a dotted line and say, yes, I believe these doctrinal principles. Salvation is literally the moment where you come before God in all humility and honesty, nothing held back, and say, Lord, I have made a mess of my life, and it's because I've been trying to do it my way, and I'm done doing it my way, and I know that I can't even do it your way because because I'm, I'm not strong enough, so I just want to surrender everything that I have, surrender all of myself to you, so you can put this mess back together again. That's salvation. And some of you have made that decision. You can look back to a specific point in time where God came in and started rebuilding your mess into something beautiful. And the moment you made that decision, you were His, and you'll never not be His, and that's glorious. And you know what else is glorious? Every day you walk with Him, your mess is becoming a little bit more beautiful. And if you haven't made that decision yet and you can't point to a time where, yes, I finally gave my mess over to God, you can do that today and it'll be the best day of your life and something you'll never regret and you'll have an opportunity in just a moment. And some of you would testify if you were honest and say, you know, there was a time when I made that decision and there was a time when I was growing and my mess was becoming more beautiful because God was working in me every day. But then somewhere along the way, I got to this point where I was willing to live a double life and come to church on Sundays and make it look like everything was fine. But really over here, I'm still doing things my way. I went back to doing things the way I want to. And if that's you, it's time to come back home and let Him go back to work on you. Because that's the glorious work, the glorious work of redemption. That's your story in the midst of His story. So, Think about our neighbors. Last two weeks ago, we shared our vision for the future of our church. Think about the chaos in the world around us. Think about the chaos in the lives of people you know. If you're in school, maybe there's somebody in your school who recently committed or attempted suicide. Maybe you work with someone who gets blackout drunk every weekend and comes back to school Uh, comes back to work on Monday telling hilarious stories, but you see the emptiness in his heart. Maybe there's a family down the street from you, and there was a moving truck out in front of their house this week because dad's moving out, because mom and dad are breaking up. Maybe you get your hair cut by someone, or or get your groceries checked out by someone, or, or have a nurse at the clinic you go to who suffered a miscarriage this last year, and she still hasn't been able to get past that. Every night she cries herself to sleep. And these are people all around us whose lives are stuck in chaos. And they don't realize there's a God who loves them. They don't realize there's a God who can bring peace to that chaos, who can, who can, who can help them find who they are in Christ and experience abundant life. And they'll never know that unless they find it in us. Our focus in the next 10 years, is that wouldn't, we wouldn't just be a, a place that concentrates on how many people we can get in a room. It's not about us turning from 800 people to 8,000 people in 10 years. God can do whatever He wants. If He chooses to grow us that way, then glory to Him. But if not, equal glory to Him because the focus is going to be us equipping one another to love the suicidal teenager, to love the alcoholic coworker, to love the broken family, to love the grieving person, to be there for them. And for some of us, it's going to be times where, hey, I have this particular skill or resource that can be a help to this person, that can help this person get beyond this particular crisis. And sometimes it's going to be, I don't have anything to offer except friendship. I can be the one person who will sit there and listen to you and not judge you and let you cry and not get tired of you and pray for you and just be there for you until you and I can walk through this darkness together. But one way or another, those are the transforming relationships we want to form. And some of those people, 10,000 times over the next 10 years, we're going to have those relationships right here within this church with the people outside these walls and some within these walls. Some of those people aren't believers, and they'll come to know Christ 
because they'll see a love in us that they haven't seen anywhere else. And some of those people maybe don't come to Christ through our direct influence, but we're responsible for getting them from being 10,000 miles away from God to maybe a couple of feet away. And someone else comes in and helps them make that decision to know Christ. And some of those people are already believers, but they've walked away from God. They've walked away from active participation within the body of Christ, and we bring them back home. And you may say, 10,000, that's a ton. I was talking to my friend Mel Brown before the service, and he said, you know, you ought to point out to people that if there's 800 of us, that means if we each had one of these relationships a year, that's 8,000 right there. It wouldn't take that many of us to have more than one a year, and we've got 10,000. This is a reachable goal. Frankly, I think we're going to blow it out of the water. But the point is that we're going to be an organization that explicitly exists for people who aren't members of this organization. You understand that? That our purpose is going to be people who've never been here before. And showing them the love of Christ through transforming relationships, one heart, one soul, one family at a time, bringing peace to the chaos, because that's God's story. Now, there is one flaw with my plan, and I see it every time I look in the mirror. The flaw with the plan is us. The flaw with the plan is that history shows us, and the Bible tells us clearly, religious people don't tend to be good at this. Because here's the thing about religion, and I'm in the religion business, so I'm not... I'm not bagging on our, our, our whole thing, but the thing is, religion, when divorced from the Holy Spirit of God, has a tendency to make us proud, has a tendency to make us fearful, has a tendency to make us see people who have messy lives and say, well, I need to avoid that person. I just need to be around the people who have their acts together, because otherwise some of their chaos will, get, will seep its way into my life. You know, Jesus could have had that attitude. Jesus could have been in heaven looking down on us saying, I don't want anything to do with that. But what did Jesus do? He came into the world. He came into a world where the most religious people had the attitude of stay away from unclean people because unclean people make you dirty. And Jesus said, unclean people are my whole business. That's why I'm here. So ask yourself the question, if your religion is more about avoiding unclean people, then you're, you've got the religion of the Pharisees. If you think that's a sign of your holiness, that you're separated from those who aren't right, then that's the religion of the Pharisees. But if your religion is about, I need to help unclean people become clean, then that's the faith of Jesus, because that's what He came to do. He came to do it even though it cost him his very life. He came to do it even though it meant dying in our place. And so in order for us to reach this vision, it's not just about one per year per person. It's about God changing our hearts. Because if we don't change, if we don't become like Him, we'll always find excuses for why we can't reach out to this person who's struggling and this person who's chaotic and this person who's in darkness, will always find reasons. So pray with me that over the course of these next 10 years, starting now, God would change our hearts and make them like His heart. That we would see our neighbors through His eyes. That kind of transformation is what it takes in order to fulfill the mission God has placed on this church, in order to see peace in the chaos of our community. And when it happens... When it happens, the world will see the glory of God, and you'll experience what Christian life was always meant to be.